and thank you for coming to this talk. Uh, my name is Andrew. Um, today I'll be talking about some work uh, that I've been doing with uh, James. Uh, James was a lecturer at the University of Wollongong and he's recently moved to uh, Trinity College uh, Dublin just a few months ago actually. So the topic is uh, non-homogeneous Poisson process intensity estimation. Um, so NHPPs um, are point processes that have varying intensity across the domain. Um, I, I'm interested in spatial temporal statistics, uh, so uh, I always view them as the spatial or temporal point processes or spatial temporal point processes where the intensity function changes in space and time. And uh, NHPPs have lots of applications. Um, I've used them for conflict uh, prediction and forecasting, such earthquake prediction, um, Twitter clicks, and uh, ev everything you can think of, which is event data. Uh, NHPPs can be good models to characterize that behavior. So just to um, put an, an image so, so we're all clear on what's happening, this is an intensity function of a temporal point process. And uh, on the top here, I've got three realizations from this uh, point process. Um, and essentially what you can see is where the intensity is high, you've got lots of events happening, lots of uh, clicks or whatever. And uh, where the intensity is uh, low, um, there are less events happening. So, so the rate of events is, is less. And uh, the, the target in, in of this work is really to get a good estimate of this intensity function simply from this uh, event data. So there are several approaches which do this, of course. Um, broadly, they divide into two classes, parametric approaches, where you divide, where you decompose the intensity function as a sum of basis functions. That's what, um, how, how I usually do that. And then you estimate the coefficients of those basis functions or non-parametric approaches. The most popular here is the kernel-based method, where you simply put a kernel on each event and you sum them all up. There would be some boundary corrections. Another popular approach is, um, is using a log Gaussian Cox process, um, where essentially you model the log of the intensity function because the intensity function is non-negative. So you model the log of that um, as a Gaussian process. Um, if we're talking about spatial temporal models, you can have some spatial temporal covariance function there. Um, and then the intensity function will be the exponential of that. Um, so, Focusing on the LGCPs, um, Gaussian processes, um, especially when accompanied with a point process uh, data model, uh, they tend to be re quite computationally efficient, inefficient. Um, inference is quite difficult actually um, when working with LGCPs when you're not considering other approximations. So um, what we wanted to do is really exploit some recent advances in machine learning uh, based on uh, triangular maps, normalizing flows, and uh, deep neural networks um, to, to see whether we can apply uh, what, what we found out in that literature to point processes. So there has been a concentrated effort recently to um, in normalizing flows, uh, which is essentially a method to uh, estimate a target probability density function. Uh, by transforming um, the, the space on which your variable is defined um, through, a, through the change of variables formula, essentially, which I talk about now. So let's talk about density estimation, and then I'll, I'll relate it to intensity estimation um, later on. So I assume you've got a target density function F0 and some very simple uh, intensity uh, density function F1. Um, then the idea is I'm going to try to estimate F0 by constructing, um, here I call it a transport map, but you can just think it of a transformation map, um, such that when I transform X, then F1 of T of X multiplied by this uh, um, determinant of the Jacobian uh, gives me then the target density, okay? So I'm calling this uh, transport map, not a, not, not a simple transformation because I will be in the next slide working with something called increasing triangular maps. And uh, there, is, uh, um, there is a way in which you can come up with increasing triangular maps via transport theory. So essentially if there's a cost function you can define and an optimal transport plan. And if you try to find the optimal transport function under those constraints, 
you end up with something known as a knotter rosenblatt uh, rearrangement, uh, which is an increasing triangular map. Um, so these increasing triangular maps are were very interesting to me when I, when I first found out about them. Um, they're, they're a very neat way for constructing multivariate bijective mappings, which is what you need when using that change of variable formula. Um, so an increasing triangular map is of this form. Um, as I said, it's a multivariate mapping. Um, so it takes a multivariate input and has a multivariate output. And the first output dimension, T1, is simply going to be monotonically increasing in the first dimension of X. Okay, so it's a simple monotonically increasing function in one dimension. Uh, T2 would be a monotonically increasing function in X2 for any given value of X1. T3 would be monotonically increasing in X3 for any given values of X1 and X2, so on and so forth. Um, and so all, all one needs to do is really find these uh, monotonic, define these monotonically increasing functions in one dimension, okay? but which are themselves functions of the other dimensions. Um, and the, what people use are what are called conditional networks most of the times. And uh, this is what a conditional network looks like. Now, why am I using the word network? Where do neural networks even come in? And I'll explain that shortly. So these TKs are, as I said, very simple functions. They're just monotonically increasing in one dimension. Um, so you can think of SK here as a straight line, as an increasing straight line, for example. But then the gradient of that straight line would have a very complicated relationship to the, to the other dimensions essentially. Um, and that is where the neural network comes in. So theta k here as a function of the other variables would be modeled using a neural network. So there are many neural networks here. You'd need a neural network for each dimension and you'd need an output for each parameter within these SK. Just to show you what some of the popular SKs used um, in, in these uh, settings, this is the straight line, okay? So xk e to the alpha k. It's, we have, we're, here we're coercing the gradient of the line to be positive, uh, plus some intercept. Okay, so this is monotonically increasing for um, in xk for every value of alpha and mu, and alpha and mu would be functions of the other dimensions via the neural network. Um, we actually use something a bit more complicated. This is also an increasing, monotonically increasing function uh, with some weights, um, a, j, and b, j. The details are not important, but all those parameters are themselves um, outputs of neural networks, and we've got j equals one to m. So um, if that seems uh, like there are lots of networks there, it gets worse. Um, so a normalizing flow is, uh, is, uh, is what has been defined as a composition of these triangular maps. So one triangular map will many times not be sufficient to achieve the flexibility you want. So you create k norm. Um, bijective mappings and you link those through composition. Um, now these increasing triangular maps, they're fantastic to work with because the, the Jacobian will be lower triangular or upper triangular, depends how you want to define your mappings, but um, they are triangular. And this gives us lots of nice properties when computing. So for example, the determinant of the Jacobian of the composition is simply the product of the individual determinants of the Jacobian. Uh, so actually computing uh, with, with, so we said there are lots of neural networks and uh, you know, lots of optimizations to do. Um, it's actually quite, quite nice to, to compute with these things. Um, all right, so how does all of this relate to um, Poisson processes? Well, um, we, if we define the, the process density associated with a Poisson process, that is simply the intensity function divided by the integrated intensity over the domain. That's mu lambda in this case. Um, so if you think of density functions, that could be any function, and mu lambda would be the normalizing constant. That's one way to think about it. So all we need to do is really go into process density space. We need to have consistent estimators for these um, integrated intensities, which is relatively easy to do. And then we can apply our um, normalizing uh, flow architectures. Um, we've also- you have, uh, you have two minutes, Andrew. Yep. 
Um, we've also uh, extended the proof which appeared in Juan et al um, from weak convergence to pointwise convergence so we can approximate uh, the, the target process density um, um, point, uh, point wise. Uh, we've also um, made some algorithms to simulate from a fitted point process via these uh, transport maps and also um, some bootstrapping methods so that we can get some uh, uncertainties on, on the fitted intensity functions. Um, so probably out of time, so I'm, I'm not going, I don't have uh, much results to show, um, but we did 1D and 2D simulation studies. Um, it works remarkably well. Timing wise, it maybe takes a couple of minutes um, in one dimension, a bit more in, in two dimensions, but still in the order of minutes. Um, and in the next slide, this is when we applied it to real data. I'm just showing some QQ plus here of the fitted versus the observed and per, um, quantiles from the point process. And the red here is uh, what we get using INLA um, with the Vian LGCP and the blue is what we got with our transport method. Um, and uh, both, are, both are doing pretty well. This is really just a proof of concept saying that uh, th th these methods um, could be useful um, when doing spatial point process. Um, all right, I think uh, I'm out of time, so, so I'll leave it there with some points. Uh, probably the most important is, uh, if you're interested, it's an archive preprint. Um, feel free to look at it, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you.